Good afternoon uh, or good morning if you're on the West Coast, or I guess good evening if you're uh, calling in from Europe as some of our presenters are today. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker for the workshop on entrepreneurial finance and innovation. Today, uh, Xavier Yaravel will present what are the labor and product market effects of automation, new evidence from France. And as you can see, um, this is joint work with Celine Antonin, Simon Bunel, and Philippe Aguillon. Um, the rules of the, the road here are basically, um, Xavier is gonna begin and he'll take a pause maybe at the 10 minute mark or so. Uh, Celine is gathering questions and um, we'll take, we'll pause for a few questions then then Xavier will keep going and then we have two discussants lined up for after the presentation. Those would be Ajay Agarwal from the University of Toronto and Anders Humlum from Princeton. Xavier, take it away. By the hope. Okay, so I should be unmuted now. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for, uh, first thanks to the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present. We're delighted to, uh, to have the opportunity to um, present our work. So today we will talk about the impact of automation, mostly actually on employment, so labor market effects. Then in the paper, we have more on the product markets, so including price effects of automation. For today, given the limited time, we'll focus a bit more on the employment side. So this is joined with Philippe, who is on the call, Celine also on the call, and Simon Bunel, who is at uh, INSEAD. So what I'll do is start very broadly by uh, giving you uh, a bird's eye view of uh, what the questions about automation are. Many of you are familiar with this, but not everyone. And then we'll zoom in into exactly what we do in the paper, and then we'll stop, take a few clarification questions, and then go on with the presentation. And we're also looking forward to the discussions by Ajay and uh, Anders. So why is automation a big topic? Well, because technologies are changing and seem to be able to operate and um, you know, perform a wide range of tasks. Robots in particular have been um, in the media and on the minds of many people, including many academics, and not only academics. So Bill Gates thought about uh, a proposal to tax robots. Andrew Yang had this as part of his proposal for the democratic campaign. And of course, these considerations are by no means new questions. They go back to at least the Luddites in 19th century England, the Luddites were worried about textile machines, again, destroying jobs. So will robots, automation technologies take all of our jobs? There's perhaps a risk, but there's also perhaps reasons for hope because we have lots of machines who are already everywhere. And in many cases, we seem to be working more productively using these machines, whether it's low skill or high skill workers, supply chain workers, or workers that have rules of supervision and uh, quality control. So to think about automation, we need to start from some definition and then we can go to measurements. And so I propose to have a look at an encyclopedia that defines automation as the class of electromechanical devices that are relatively self-operating after they've been set in motion on the basis of predetermined instructions or procedures. So the key words here are these machines are self-operating operating, and uh, they, they are operating based on predetermined instructions. So that would cover a large range of, of equipment, robots, an example, but there are many others, for example, conveyors. And so the key question is whether automation raises or lowers the employ employment and the productivity of labor. There is a very vast literature on this, going back to at least Keynes and Leontief, who raised the technological unemployment hypothesis. That's a natural hypothesis because by definition, Automation is labor saving at the task level. The point of automation is to replace the workers. But of course, this automation could induce productivity gains and therefore higher demands and the need for implementing new tasks, for example, quality control. So it could be that in the end, the introduction of these automation technologies could be labor augmenting and promote employment, increase wages or increase real wages by a price effect. When you, when you zoom out from the task level and you look at the level of a plant or the level of a firm or the level of an industry or at the level of the macroeconomy. So that's a, this trade-off that's sometimes summarized at, as a productivity effect versus a displacement effect. 
there's a ton of studies on uh, automation and it's interesting to bear in mind the four perennial issues that any study has to confront. One, very simple, is how to measure automation. Second, at what level should we measure the patterns of substitution or complementarity between these technologies and, and uh, employment? Should we focus on the plant level, firm level, industry level, think about local labor markets, think at the level of the economy? Answers might be different, that there's different le levels of action. Three, how can we estimate causal effects? And then four, how can we characterize the distributional effects that may be at play? Think about different workers of different skill groups, but also think of consumers, think of firm owners. So you can see it's a vast set of questions. So what we'll see today is um, you know, how we, we try to make progress on all of those points. What we do in this paper is contribute to the literature in three ways. First, we study automation at three distinct levels, the plant level, the firm level, and the industry level to see to what extent effects change depending on the level of aggregation. Two, for causal identification, we're going to develop a shift share research design, on which I'll tell you more in a second. And then three, for the distributional effects, we'll document empirically the impacts on workers with studies of employment and wages, but also effects on consumers via price effects, and also effects on firm profits. Although today, we will mostly focus on employment effects. So we do this in the context of France using a linked employer-employee data set that covers all of the French firms in the manufacturing sector between 1994 and 2015. We'll measure automation uh, and more broadly industrial equipment using uh, two types of, uh, of measures. First is balance sheet information that measures the value of industrial equipment used for automation type tasks. And then B, exploiting the fact that most common automation technologies operate with electric motors and uh, more pre precisely require motive power, which we will be able to, able to measure quite precisely. So that I'll go into detail in, in a couple of slides. The point is that with this, we have, a, we think a fairly broad measure of automation and uh, that's not going to be just robots, importantly. We could use some of our data to zoom in on the robots and see if robots behave differently from other technologies. We're not going to do that today. That's something that's, that's ongoing. One caveat is that what we do is not about AI. It's not about machine learning, which you might say is going to be the next revolution, might be very important going forward. That's something that's not going to be included in our measures. So let me give you just a brief preview of the research design and brief view of the results, and then we'll discuss uh, mostly quick clarification questions that, that might arise and then move on. So we proceed in two steps to think about the relationship between automation and employment and also prices. So the first step is going to be descriptive evidence on the population of firms and plants. What we'll do is draw some event studies that exploit the timing of adoption of industrial equipment across different plants in the same firm or across different firms in the same industry and see how the path of employment changes as you introduce these uh, automation technologies. Step two is to think more carefully about causality using the shift share research design. And so that will have to be restricted to a subset of firms as opposed to step one. For the shift share design, we'll focus on firms which import industrial equipment from abroad. And the intuition for, for the shift share design is to combine two things, shifters and shares. The shifters are the change in the productivity of foreign suppliers of equipment. And B, the shares are predetermined importer supplier relationships. So the idea is that if I have pre-existing pre relationships with say China for textile machines, and next period China's productivity specifically for textile machines increases, I, am, I have an advantage in uh, buying these cheaper machines from, uh, from China, and so I'm more likely to adopt uh, these technologies or expand my use of these technologies. So this is, the idea here is to approximate an ideal experiment that would randomly assign prices of automation technologies across firms. And so that's interesting, uh, in particular, if you want to think about the effects of something like uh, robot tax, which effectively would shift the price of, of, of a particular kind of automation technology. So that's for the two broad steps that we'll go through today. Let me give you the, the findings. So we find with both the event study and shift share designs that uh, increased automation is to actually an increase in employment, which we were initially quite surprised by, and also a fall in, uh, in consumer prices. And so those are going to be firm level results. We find that both for employment at the plant level and the firm level, 
uh, employment increases with an elasticity of about 0.3 after three years. We also see an increase in sales, wages remain stable, the labor share remains stable. In parallel, we see falling prices with elasticities of about minus 0.2 after three years. And that's consistent with a simple demand cost channel. So as, as you increase automation, your marginal cost falls. You pass on some of these gains to consumers, so prices fall, so demand for your product increases, you, you expand your scale, and as a result, employment increases. And so those are going to be firm level results on which we focus for most of the talk today. And at the end, we'll talk about industry level relationships, which in principle could be different. Right? It could be that firms that expand in an industry when they acquire more automation technologies, they expand at the expense of some other firms in the same industry. Uh, and so on nets, the effect on employment may not be positive. Or in fact, we find that at the industry level, the relationship also appears to be positive, but only in sectors that are quite exposed to international trade. And so it's the idea that, it, that automation technologies make you uh, better able to, um, to be productive in the face of international competition. And you have these business ceiling effects that operate at the international level. We also touch on distributional effects across skill groups. It's a question that comes back often. Turns out that so far we haven't found large differences across different skill groups. We suspect that there may be more differences, uh, for example, comparing people who do routine tasks and others, but that's not something that we will be able to, do, to say much uh, about today. But it's sort of interesting that at broad levels, the employment response is positive. Uh, one word on the related literature and then turning over to you and Celine for uh, questions. So there's obviously an immense literature on this. Uh, industry level studies so far have found mixed results. Certainly it's a challenge to identify causal effects at the level of industries, given the limited variation in the data. But if you think about automation in general as measured in patents or surveys, some studies have found negative effects, other positive effects. And even in the case of industrial robots specifically, uh, there, some teams have found negative effects in the US, other teams have found positive effects, for example, in Germany. One way to interpret our results is that they can help explain these discrepancies in the literature uh, to the extent that some countries like Germany are more open than other countries like the United States, and therefore it could be that the net effect becomes positive only in the countries that are relatively more open because it makes them more competitive. Uh, in international markets. And so number two, there's also a recent virgin literature that expands very fast that studies in particular robots at the firm level. And this is, for example, the work of Anders uh, that will uh, talk about our work later in the discussion and many other teams that have studied many different countries, um, mostly European countries. So relative to these studies, what we do is three things. One is that we're going to have a focus that's broader than just robots, and eventually we hope to compare robots to other automation technologies. Two, most of these studies use uh, difference and differences, so event studies, which we'll do as well, but there there are still concerns about causality. So we'll go one step further with the shift share design. And then we'll also apply this not just to the firm level, but also to the industry level. And later we hope to the level of local labor market to see all these different levels of aggregation in a unified setting where we can study uh, these effects. And then the last thing is that we don't just do employment, we also look at profits, consumer prices. So this gives you a sense of where we position ourselves. And uh, this is the roadmap. First we'll talk about the data, then status facts and event study, then the shift share IV, and then briefly some industry level results and other extensions. But first, we'll take some of your questions that Celine has been uh, monitoring. Yes, so um, maybe, yeah, I, I have two kinds of questions from Song and from uh, David. So the, the first question maybe is, uh, uh, so will this setting view automation uh, technology exogenous to firm decision or will firms actively uh, make investment to automate themselves? So this is the, the first question. Is it exogenous mm -hmm. or not? Uh, there is another question uh, about, um, so a, a question by David uh, asking if it is essentially a baritic on the productivity of the supplier. Um, there is also a question on firm age. Um, all the firms who, who which adopt the new technologies, the uh, sorry, all the firms we, which adopt the technologies, new or old firms. So, uh, what is the interaction between firm age and the adoption of technologies? 
And there is also a question about um, machine learning and AI. Can the results we have be generalized to machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence? Great. Thanks a lot for all these questions. So I should say that, of course, we won't be able to answer all the questions. And so, but what we'll make sure we do is we'll read the Q&A at the end and you know, follow up individually with you by email for the questions we don't have time to, to discuss here. So don't hesitate to ask more questions. And so on the four questions that Celine uh, relates, uh, regarding the exogeneity, the way we want to think about this for today is that we're going to focus on one source of variation, which we think is policy relevant. So it's basically what we're trying to do is approximate the change in the price of automation technologies. And so when, if you were to change that, what would happen to firms? So that's one part of obviously a much broader question, uh, but we think that's an interesting way of thinking about causality in a reduced form and policy relevant way. On the idea of Baltic on productivity of supplier, yes, exactly. And then the shares are, so the shocks are productivity of supplier and the shares are uh, these uh, import linkages from the past. And firm age, we haven't looked at that very much. What we can say is that firms that adopt um, these automation technologies tend to be larger. So I, I presume also that they, are, uh, that they are older, but we can certainly do more descriptively to describe what, who, who, what these firms are. And then AI, machine learning, as I previewed, that's something that's not going to be uh, covered here. I would advertise the work of others. Uh, for example, IJ has a lot of work on this, and there are others like Michael Webb, but lots of interesting papers on, on, on this. So let's go on with, uh, with the data. Uh, I will go relatively so, briefly. Uh, the time. Sorry, Xavier, yes. maybe a last question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, we, you will answer during the presentation, but would you be able to say something about cross-industry substitution? Uh, so the, the question is, uh, the concern is expansion of one industry will come at the expense of other industries. Yeah, so that's a, that's a fair point. So you can sort of always sort of shift, shift the, the, the lamppost. And so you can always think about substitution effects at different levels. Uh, my sense is that at the industry level, we're going to be underpowered to do this empirically, but we can think about uh, using a model with reasonable elasticity of substitution, demand elasticity of substitution in particular, to assess whether what we see is likely to occur mostly uh, at the expense of other industries. Our view so far is that the industry level, it's really important to think about international business ceiling effects, so reallocation between domestic and uh, foreign suppliers, rather than changes between different domestic industries, but that's certainly something that we want to think more about. So the, the data that we start with, uh, one side of it is worker firm level data from standard French databases, which offers a match employer employee data sets covering all plants in the manufacturing sector from 1994 to 2015. So we'll see lots of interesting outcomes for these firms and plants, including for the workers, their wages and measures of occupation, which we can mass, match to task in the future. So our conceptual notion of automation is this idea that uh, it's a set of operating, self-operating machines. And so often these machines tend to be electromechanical devices. And so we'll use that to, um, to think about our measure. So to be precise, there will be two types of measures. One is at the level of firms, it's going to use balance sheet data on uh, industrial equipment and machines. So this is going to be excluding forms of capital that are not industrial equipment used in the production process, but we're not going to be able to say very precisely what exactly these machines are. So for example, a forklift that someone has to operate would count, would fall under that measure of uh, the balance sheet, uh, the measure of, um, of automation. And so to go one step further and be a bit finer, we'll also go to the plant level where we uh, are able to use electricity consumption records. In particular, we can see electricity consumption for motors that are directly used in the production process. This is a data set that's assembled by INSEE and going on since 1983. And it distinguishes between different types of electric electricity use, including motive power and then other uses. And so we'll focus specifically on motive power to exclude things like heating, cooling, or servers. And so that's a measure that uh, we have at, um, at the plant level. And the disadvantage is that it's only a, a large sample of firms. It's not going to cover, it's a large sample of plant, plants, not going to cover all of the firms, while the first measure from the balance sheet information covers everything. So we'll go back and forth between these two measures. Um, let me say a bit more with the, um, 
about the limitations of this. So the consumption of electricity from out of power, what's interesting that it covers a broad set of automation technologies and it's available at the plant level. But there are issues in particular due to variation in efficiency. It's difficult to draw comparisons across different industries or over time. So for example, you might use a lot of motive power, but perhaps this machine is not very useful in the production process. Uh, so what we'll do is just statistically have a battery of fixed effects to ensure that we only compare apples to apples. So we compare different plants that are in the, diff in the same industry at the same time. And we've also checked that the relationship with the balance sheet measures we have is positive and monotonic. So we're not subject to issues that could in principle exist, such as perhaps I buy a new machine, which is so energy efficient that when I automate more, my consumption of motive power falls because I've become so much more energy efficient. For the event study, uh, another aspect of this is that we would not want to simply capture changes of electricity consumption as a variable input. What we want is focus on investments. So instead of using the measure of usage of electricity consumption, what we'll do is focus on the change in peak capacity for motive power, which INSEE also tracks. So basically when you buy new machines, you need to make sure you have enough capacity and uh, we have records for, for peak capacity specifically for motive power. So that's going to be the measure we use when we talk about uh, electricity. And so one simple way to think about what we cover is to think about how the, um, what's the distribution of our motive force measure across different industries. So we see it for chemicals, it's very important, rubber as well, paper to glass and ceramics, food and beverages. Those are the five large industries with the uh, largest fraction of motive force. That's in contrast with the measure of robots that's been studied more commonly. So robots, for example, in chemicals are not used. Um, in fact, uh, robots, I'll show you later, are concentrated almost exclusively. Over the 50% of robots are found in the automobile industry. Um, so you can see many examples of uh, machines that require motive power, like pasta machines, uh, lots of chemical machines, uh, rubber machines, uh, paper, glass and ceramics. And so we think it's a useful way to, to cover a broad set of industries um, while still focusing on uh, a fairly well-defined set of technologies which are plugged in the production process and use, use motive power. Um, so that is the backdrop for the measures that uh, we use and we have more detail in the paper and I think the discussant will also touch a lot on, on this question. So I'll move on and uh, now go a bit slower for the stylus and event studies and then the shift chair IV. So we start from a simple question. There's one view that remains fairly common, which is that firms that use more automation technologies reduce their labor force because workers are replaced by machines over time. And so we'll document first very simply descriptively whether the data supports this hypothesis. That is when a firm relies more extensively on machines or electric motors, what happens to employment? And uh, I'll just show you this simple graphs first and then we'll do an event study to alleviate some problems with identification although the main strategy will be the, the shift share design a bit later so the simplest thing to do is to compare the path of sales employment and the labor share in plants that increased faster their consumption of electricity from out of power compared to other plants we'll just compare the plants in the top 50 percent versus the bottom 50 percent given uh, ranking them by their increase in electric motor use between the fir first three years of our sample, 1995 to 1998. So if you do this, you find that uh, the plants in the top 50% have a, a, a larger increase in sales. So they, they show up here in red with the triangles. So sales expand faster. If you look at the ratio of labor cost to sales, the two groups behave very similarly. Uh, if now you focus on uh, low skill employment, here, the, the measures we take uh, for low skill are mostly based on um, education that have been built by others. And so here, what you see is sort of interesting is that there's a decrease in low skill employment at all the plants we have in our data, but that decrease is less pronounced for the plants that um, actually rely more on our proxy for automation technology, which is electric motor use uh, based on motive power. If you look at high skill uh, employment, same thing, it's the, here you see a, a positive trend that is at 
they for both, but the increase is faster for the group that uh, that uses more um, more uh, electric motor uh, consumption. So one first step to um, to to make progress towards identification is to use um, to use a distributed lead lag model. So what we'll do is see what happens um, in a model like this. So you have uh, so you can think of this as a generalization of event studies when uh, you're in a setting when you have events every year because essentially every year firms change their degree of reliance on uh, electric motor consumption. Uh, and so we we have this distributed lead lag model where the question delta k is shows the relationship between a change in electric motor consumption in terms of peak capacity at time t minus k. How is this correlated with employment at time t? So it's a specification that allows for delayed response to employment to information. The causal interpretation requires strong assumption. It requires that change in automation is not correlated with, uh, with other shocks. And so certainly you can use leads, as we often do, as a first falsification test, but also you can't rule out potential demand or supply shocks that would happen at the same time. And certainly we think of many of those. For example, if there's more competition and uh, because of that, I adopt more uh, automation technologies that would also have an impact on employment and could bias my results. If demand goes up, and therefore, I have a, now an incentive to pay a fixed cost and increase my productivity, and demand would have also a direct effect on employment. So we're not going to want to push this too much, but it's already interesting to see what the pattern is, just to test that common view that when you automate more, employment falls. And we add a battery of fixed effects to, to alleviate some of these concerns, which I won't have time to go into here to save time for, for the shift share design. So what do we find? Well, we find regarding employment, that employment increases following increased use of machine with an elasticity of 0 0.2 on impact and 0 0.4 after eight years. And that's depicted in this graph here. So on the, on the um, x-axis, you have the years relative to the change in electricity consumption for motors. We, we um, aggregate the data into blocks of two years to reduce noise. You can also do this year by year. Uh, and so this is a distributed lead lag model. The estimated elasticity, the delta Ks are plotted on uh, the y-axis. So you see that it's fairly flat before. So it's not like the firms that start increasing their reliance on motive power at time zero were on a different trend before. But after that, there is a change and indeed they, they have higher employment with elasticity of employment to increase automation of about 0 0.4 after uh, 10 years. You can do this um, with different sets of fixed effects. This was two digit industry by year fixed effect. We can do this for more detailed industry in each year so that we control for all demand and supply shock at the level of industry year. This looks very similar. Uh, we can um, do this with firm by year fixed effects, comparing now different plants that are in the same firm. So it's sort of interesting because you, know, you can still think of stories, different plants produce different goods perhaps, but um, we're in the process of repeating this for, uh, for monoproduct firms. So we find very, very similar patterns at all these levels of aggregation, which to us signals in a very simple way that uh, something positive is going on for employment. Are there heterogeneous effects across skill groups? Well, we, we find no heterogeneity across broad skill groups measured by education, uh, but there could be potentially effects within these groups uh, that we uh, haven't investigated so far. So these graphs show positive effect for high skill, medium skill, low skill. And we have similar results when you do the analysis at the level of a firm instead of a plant. Um, or if you, uh, if you yeah. So let me move on to uh, another point I want to flag for today, which is price effects. So we repeat the previous exercise, except that on the left-hand side, now we have prices instead of employment. So we look at the relationship between changes in, auto, changes in automation and price changes using export prices. Export prices are measured as the unit value of exported products. It's that's available for all exporting firms from customs data. So you have the usual potential concerns that composition of products might change a bit, but we have very detailed product categories, HS10 codes, and so we, we control for fixed effects at this level. And we find that uh, export prices fall sharply after an increase in the firm's uh, industrial equipment. So the estimated elasticity of prices reaches 
minus 0 0.2 after two years, minus 0 0.3 after eight years. So that suggests that firms that automate pass through some of the productivity gains to consumers that leads to higher demand for their products and therefore more employment. It's a standard demand reallocation channel, which is depicted graphically here. So same story as before, no apparent pretrend, and then something happens exactly around time zero. Let's estimate elasticity minus 0 0.3 after six years. So this is interesting and to us was surprising because we weren't expecting to find these, uh, these positive descriptive patterns. Um, but there are strong limitations because we cannot address uh, potentially correlated demand or supply shocks. We've done some of this with the firm by ear fixed effects, for example, but you can always think of stories with correlated supply shocks. So we'll address this in two ways. One is a simple falsification test where instead of electricity used for, um, for motive power, I can use electricity for heating or um, yeah, for heating and other also other energy used in the production process to see if somehow we might be spuriously capturing a change in the scale of the firm. Uh, and there we find no relationship. But then more importantly, we'll do the shift chair design. So this is the falsification test where it's the same thing as before, except that now we use uh, heat, electricity used for heating or uh, energy used in the production process like oil. And there's no pattern. So that confirms that we're not, at least spuriously, it seems we're not just capturing a, say a demand shock or that would push you to do more in the short run, do more of everything. So now let's, uh, let's take a, a moment to think about the shift chair IV. We have about 14 minutes left, unless there's important questions that showed up that Celine saw, we'll just carry on. So the shift chair IV, um, you, is have a, about, you have about tw 12 minutes or so. Okay. 12 minutes. Great. So the, um, the ideal experiments we have in mind is the following. We would like to randomly assign purchasing prices for machines and robots across firms. Uh, I give robots here just as a tangible example because tax on robots is something that's actively discussed. And so with that in mind, we are going to approximate this with a shift share research design that has two components, the shocks, which is the variation in the cost of imported machines over time across different international trading partners. And the exposure shares is variation in pre-existing supply relationships across French firms. In general, it's hard to use prices because there could also be changes in quality. So what we'll do intuitively is infer quality adjusted price changes for machines and robots from changes in trade flows. So if machines from particular kind of, um, of industry, like textile machines, the market share of China increases a lot between 1996 and uh, 2000, we will infer that uh, the quality adjusted price of the Chinese machines has been, uh, has been going down. And so French firms, might be differentially exposed to this because some of some French firms already had relationship with China in the pre-period and others not. So to be a bit more precise, let me define the different terms and then show you the specification that we estimate. So the shocks uh, across trading partners by sectors, let's call them GN. So the way we're actually going to measure this is to think about the, is to measure the aggregate change in import flows of machines for each trading partner so those are countries, Germany, Italy, Japan, China, some of the more important ones. We do this for each two digit industry. And then we effectively infer from the change in trade flows that some countries do particularly well uh, in the supply of machines in specific sectors, specific period. Examples of this are Italy does particularly well for textile in the 1990s. Germany does well for automobile machines in the 2000s. The Netherlands does well for conveyors and other machines used for food products after 2010. So that's the shocks and then the shares, we'll, we'll denote them S-I-N. And so this is the share of trading partner N, a country by sector, in firm I's total imports of machines. Because of switching costs, we think that French firms are more likely to benefit from an increase in a trading partner's productivity if this firm has a pre-existing importing relationship with them. For the standard reason, we're gonna use lag shares because we think that software saying the recording has stopped but I continue uh, so here is a way you can uh, summarize what we do um, which is we're still looking at the change in employment delta li and the change in model consumption delta mi 
uh, we're considering uh, now five year periods because we have to aggregate the data to get statistical power. And so we're gonna run a two stage least square specification where the instrument is ZI. So Z is a standard Bartic object that com combines the exposure shares SIN with the shocks GN. And, the, and so it's with a panel aggregating the data over five year periods. We have 204 trading partners and 24 two digit industries. So effectively a lot of shocks because the shocks are trading partner by industry. And so for this to work, you need relevance. You need the, the, certainly the, the, the instrument to have power, that's standard. And so one way to think of this graphically is to what extent do you stick to the same main importer? So we've shown this in this graph. Uh, and you can also show the first stage directly, but this is a way to gauge that this makes sense intuitively. So if you look at the relationship between a firm and its main supplier, um, that relationship tends to be um, to be increasing uh, over time very strongly. So over uh, 15 years, you keep the same uh, country as your main supplier for 12 years. Right? So you, you rarely switch. So to be precise about the identification assumption, we can put this uh, formally in, in in math using the you know the recent literature on shift share design. But maybe just stating this in, in word in words is is, is more helpful. Um, so the exclusion restriction is that firms that are linked to increasingly productive suppliers should not be unobservably different. So the fact that I had relationships with China last period and that this period China is doing better, that shouldn't say something about me. That's not observable. That's inherently untestable, but as always, you can do falsification tests with proxies for firm productivity. Uh, so for example, using the lagged outcome variable pre-trend test. So we'll do this and find uh, no, uh, no pre-trends. So what are the results? Well, we uh, implement the shift share design with various firm controls, uh, such as turnover, investment, total assets, employment. We'll show sensitivity to additional controls. But uh, the bottom line is that here as well, we find a positive employment response with an elasticity that's very similar to what we found earlier with the event study of around 0.3. And we also find positive sales response of uh, similar magnitude, 0 0.3 to 0.4. We don't find responses of the average wage, uh, and we find that the payroll share remains unchanged. For the wage, we don't want to push these results too strongly so far, because at this point, we're not controlling for changes in the composition of individuals. So we're just measuring the average wage at the firm, but it could be that the underlying set of worker is changing uh, and so we're not making any statement within a worker at this point, although we can in, in the future. So the table here summarizes the results from the shift share IV. So you have the first stage F statistic, and you have different specifications uh, showing the ID coefficient. So this says that when uh, automation increases by 1%, uh, employment increases by 0.3% in column one with the baseline industry year control, and then we add more control in column two, and then in column three, we control for lag the motor consumption um, as a potential proxy in case there was a pre-trend in the use of automation before. The bottom line is that the, these estimates are all uh, similar statistically. We also control for exports since uh, our Baltic shock uses trade data. You might think that these firms that import more perhaps also export more and something is going on with exports. We also control for exports and uh, the results remain similar. The falsification test, on the other hand, uh, shows no such patterns. It's estimated somewhat imprecisely, but uh, there's no positive, you know, sign switches from positive to negative, um, so this is comforting. Sales increase uh, with elasticity that vary between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. The labor share remains similar, and we find similar results when we use uh, other automation measure. Here we're using the electricity measure, but we can also use the balance sheet measure. And we can measure labor share in different ways. Share of value added, share of sales, the picture is the same. So I have perhaps a couple minutes left. How many? Two or three? Yeah, maybe three or four minutes, exactly. Maybe three or four minutes, so that's perfect. So we'll briefly now touch on the industry level results and some extensions that perhaps we can uh, discuss during the Q&A. 
So that positive plant level and firm level relationship that we found uh, between employment and automation, in principle, could be overturned when you go to the industry level because firms that automate less may be displaced by firms that automate more. So we're going to estimate the industry level relationship between employment and automation and also prices. Uh, for this, now we're going to focus on the balance sheet value measure because it's a comprehensive measure. And so we want to use that to aggregate uh, properly to the industry level. So for today, we can only share with you a descriptive analysis uh, without uh, shift share IV, but we'll add that uh, later on that's in the work. So a descriptive analysis just uses the panel structure of the data with fixed effects. And so we find the following. We find for employment that uh, on average, the relationship between employment and automation remains industries. There's a lot of heterogeneity. In particular, the positive employment effects are concentrated in industries with higher exposure to international competition. And that's consistent with the importance of business stealing across countries. For prices and profits, we find that uh, automation benefits both consumers through lower prices as well as firm owners via increased profits. Uh, and we also find, uh, interestingly, uh, that industries that use automation more sell more to low-income consumers. So we basically can use that uh, consumer data matched to national accounts to think about the expenditure channel of automation, which has had less, uh, been documented much less in the existing literature. But just wanted to state these results, illustrate them with some graphs here you should see on the the panel on the left, uh, the, um, the OLS relationship for industries that are more exposed to international competition. So it's positive relationship between employment and machines on the, the right panel, uh, it's a flat relationship. We also see on this graph here that uh, uh, industries that uh, have a higher share of, uh, of their costs devoted to industrial equipment, that's measured on the X axis, they tend to sell to consumers that are a bit uh, less wealthy on average. Here on the y-axis, we're measuring the average consumer income using uh, using sales weights to measure the average consumer income. So that's bringing together other data sources that, unfortunately, we, we don't have time to go into much here, but just wanted to flag that this is, we think, another useful uh, angle to study the distributional effects through price effects and through spending shares. So far, we find that, if anything, lower income groups might benefit a bit more and the main pattern is the fall in, in prices. In extensions, we think about heterogeneity uh, more, uh, more systematically, looking at uh, the impact on occupations that perform routine tasks, looking at differences between robots and other forms of automation, and also looking at wages uh, using panel identifiers for workers to address potential changes in composition. So that uh, leaves me with that conclu conclusion slide. So again, the big picture is that we trying to do three things. One is have a setting where we can study effects at different levels of aggregation, plant level, firm level, industry level. So far, and we have mostly plant level and firm level results that we are able to share with you. Number two, for causal identification, we have this Bartek design using productivity of uh, international suppliers. And then three, uh, on the distributional effects, we want to compare effects for different workers, but also different consumers. And uh, I haven't told you too much about firm profits today, but we see an increase in, uh, in firm profits. So the bottom line is that uh, it seems that when you look at automation with our measure of motive power and uh, the balance sheet value of industrial equipment, the results increase, uh, suggest that there can be productivity gains that are broadly shared across workers, consumers, firm owners. That may be different for more specific technologies like robots, that may be different for the technologies of tomorrow like AI, but it wasn't obvious to us that we would find this um, even uh, with automation technologies more broadly. And uh, another takeaway we, uh, we didn't really expect is just this, this fact that uh, at the industry level, the relationships might, might differ quite a bit depending on the degree of exposure to international trade. And, so from a policy perspective, attempting to curb domestic automation uh, on your own to protest domestic employment might be self-defeating because of foreign competition. You would use robots, automation technologies indirectly through imported goods. Thank you very much for, um, for your attention. We look forward to the questions and uh, the discussion. Uh, so, and, and David, can you hear me okay?
yeah, we can hear you. You're, you're, you're great. All right. Well, listen, uh, thanks very much, uh, Song and uh, Michael and David and Yal. Thank you for inviting me to discuss this. Uh, I really enjoyed this paper, so it's a pleasure to discuss it. Paper is called, What are the Labor and Product Market Effects of Automation? New Evidence from France. If I wrote this paper, I would have given it a different title, uh, this one. Uh, automation, what's not to like? It's good for workers, uh, it's good for consumers, it's good for firms. Um, in other words, the results of this paper are unambiguously positive for automation. <clears throat> um, so the paper is timely, of course. There's a lot of interest now more than ever in automation uh, because of social distancing. Uh, the machines uh, are able to do things that uh, humans couldn't before. So the, the amount of capital flowing into automation has really shot up even recently. So this, this paper is particularly timing, uh, timely now. I'm gonna focus on three bits. Uh, <clears throat> start off with some, what I view as the, some of the key highlights of the paper. Uh, a few caveats and then uh, close with some questions. So for me, uh, there, there were really, uh, there are a number of highlights, but I'll, I'll share with you three of them. The first one is, you know, this relationship between automation and employment. Um, there are of course many papers on this and trying to get at a causal relationship is tough. And so they do a, a number of things in the paper that for me, in my view, go quite, uh, quite a distance and in some respects further than prior papers with regards to establishing a causal relationship uh, here. So, so they start off with this uh, sort of diff and diff and, um, and importantly, they show uh, a, an absence of a pre-trend uh, before uh, they, they get this uh, you know, lift in, the, um, in automation, which in this case they measure by uh, a, a jump in electricity consumption. Uh, and importantly, they, they include this falsification test. So uh, um, Avier didn't get a chance to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, before I got to this part in the paper, I was concerned that there was something more general going on. And then when I saw this falsification test, um, I, I found this uh, helpful that there was no, no real effect um, in these other areas of, of uh, energy consumption, uh, like heating. Um, of all of the event studies, this one was my favorite uh, in figure five, where they have a, an actual, um, you know, they're, they're looking at these effectively, uh, the, the big step function changes in, um, in balance sheet value of industrial equipment. And so, uh, you know, they've got quite a few different figures where, the ways, where is it they're trying to cut this and the, the use of the term event study is a little bit misleading for some of the other ones um, in terms of, of sort of what the event is because they can have events every year. But this one is a very specific event uh, a measure. And so I, that's why I like this one the best and the results are quite good. And then of course they do their shift share uh, and with, the, with the instrument that Avi described, which is also quite convincing. This is at the industry level as opposed to the other ones that are at the uh, firm or the plant level. Uh, but they're all quite consistent and remarkably, the, um, the coefficients are, are quite similar uh, across these. So that's interesting. So that's the first thing is that it's just there, all the work they do on trying to establish a causal relationship uh, is a great contribution in this uh, automation and employment uh, domain. The second thing that is a, a feature of this paper that I like a lot is they go beyond employment and they get into prices and profits. So we get a sense of who's benefiting. Uh, so not only are, are employees benefiting from automation, but so are both consumers and firms. And so they measure uh, an increase in profits and a decline in prices. At this part in the paper, if you're like me, you're starting to think, wait a minute, uh, you know, th that automation is all great and uh, what's, what's not to like. Um, <clears throat> and, and so uh, uh, in, addition to, in addition to that, they, they walk through the mechanism, you know, what they call the, the productivity effect versus the displacement effect. Um, it's, you know, their, their view of how the, uh, the productivity effect works is uh, more automation leads to higher productivity, higher productivity leads to, more, to lower prices, more prices uh, increases demand, and therefore uh, more employment. 
And of course, what that will, you know, I think to kind of put the cherry on top of here, what they, if they could show that their impacts were greater at industries with greater demand elasticity, um, because that's what this whole thing relies on. This relies on the fact that when prices drop, demand increases, and that's what leads to more employment. And so if that's true, then, and they can show that their results are stronger in industries that have higher um, uh, uh, price elasticity, demand elasticity, then, uh, then I think they can really close the loop on this and make this a, quite a convincing story. So that, that last step is missing, uh, but I suspect they, you know, they, they may be able to do it. Um, okay, so a couple of caveats. Uh, and I, I offer these caveats really as, as, as uh, just comments because overall the, the paper is really uh, excellent and I, I like it a lot. Um, so the first one here is, is you know, there, there are two primary measures of automation, which is of course the centerpiece of this paper. Uh, one is what they call balance sheet value of industrial machines and the other is power consumption. And they, they raise these caveats with why they, you know, what they're concerned about with the balance sheet value. And I have to say, I read it and thought, I'm not as worried as they are. Uh, they, they're worried that sometimes that some of their machinery isn't fully automated. Uh, in other words, there's humans involved. That doesn't bother me at all. Even in very sophisticated artificially, you know, artificial intelligence systems, there's often humans involved. It's just a matter of degree. Uh, it matters, you know, whether the human is, is engaged in the moment or the human's engaged uh, earlier in the process. So I'm not in any way put off by this definition um, that, uh, that includes uh, machines that have human involvement and nor am I put off by the fact that sometimes the machines are more general uh, than, than the definition that they've used, which is, is tied to its pre-specified set of tasks. I don't know why that should matter. And so the, the, at least the two concerns they raise with this measure don't bother me uh, at all. So I'm less concerned than the authors about, about that. However, I'm more concerned with their other measure, uh, their power consumption measure. Um, what I'm worried about is that the, you know, all of the, the work in automation, um, it seems to be, there seems to be a, a growing emphasis over time in um, energy efficiency, whether it's specifically called clean tech or not. And so uh, not only is energy efficiency a dimension that matters, but it's, it, the, the importance has changed over time. And so I'm worried that this has an, uh, is going to uh, upward bias the results because the, the degree of energy efficiency uh, is something that seems to be increasing over time. And of course, there's many examples of this. I've just picked one of them. 40% energy increase in the machinery associated with cooling, uh, cooling systems at Google. Um, <clears throat> okay, and, and now this is the next caveat, which raised just some, some uh, raised my eyebrows a bit, where they say um, that they can't reject, there's no impact of automation on the labor share. So in other words, what there's, you know, their conclusion is here that automation doesn't change labor share, so labor to sales. Um, and so this made me very curious, you know, why not, uh, as automation is increasing, why isn't the share, uh, falling? And, uh, that's made me wonder, is there something unusual about France? How generalizable are the results, um, when France seems to be, a, to some extent, an outlier? Uh, this is the, uh, labor share by country. Over, I've circled the time period of their study, 1994 to 2015. And you can see that France has a different sh uh, shape during this period than, than most other countries. And many of the other studies in this uh, topic have focused in US data. And you can see that it's, uh, US is a different kettle of fish uh, on this dimension. Um, and, and if you were worried that when that US data that I just showed you um, whether that, you know, how much of that is manufacturing or whether that really is driven by manufacturing, the answer is yes. Uh, manufacturing is a significant drop in uh, payroll to, to sales. Uh, so in other words, I think a, a caveat here of this paper is, it, is that are the results that we're seeing France-specific results? Now, why would they be? What's, what's so different about France? 
uh, well, here's one thing is that their uh, employment protection legislation is significantly stronger. And so- uh, Ajay, the, just uh, quickly, one, one minute. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. So significantly increased amount of um, protection for workers in France, uh, lots of other countries that are similar to France, others that are more similar to the US. Um, also a little bit worried about the, uh, uh, is this really being driven by a few firms? So if you look here, the, in terms of change of employment, uh, a small fraction of industries are positive, the rest are negative. Uh, and so how much of this data is driven by uh, companies that have actually uh, lost employment, but they've lost less employment when they've had more machines. So if a fair amount of this curve is specified by industries that have actually lost employment. So it's, the title is a bit misleading. Um, and, and of course, there's a, quite a few industries that have lost a lot of employees uh, and diminished the amount of uh, equipment. Uh, so in other words, they're in decline. Uh, there's outliers here that are potentially dragging around the regression line. We, I'd like just like the authors to speak to those. Um, and so uh, maybe what I'll just conclude with here is how much of this story is a story about superstar firms driving superstar industries. Um, I, I just circled this, this uh, thing on the, on their descriptive statistics that these, uh, there's, uh, the average firm here is quite small, 30 million euros in revenue. And, um, and it's a very skewed distribution. So, uh, so I'll just close here with, with whether the phenomena we're seeing of increasing automation, increasing employment is a story of a small fraction of superstar firms leading super, you know, that are the stars in their industry that are, are driving the results of the paper. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Um, so um, this is an, really important paper, I think. It makes uh, three key contributions to my, to my reading. Uh, first, the po uh, paper proposes new measures of automation, both at the plant and the firm level. So I think this is a really uh, noble deed uh, because a key stumbling block for the literature has simply been the lack of data on firms' automation activities. Second, the paper does not only stop at the firm level, but traces out how automation plays out at the plant, firm, and industry levels. So the econometric analysis here is really transparent and very well executed. Finally, the paper provides, and I was excited about this, um, to my knowledge, the first empirical evidence on the interaction between automation and tradability in shaping domestic employment outcomes. So um, I think this is an important finding because as, as uh, already emphasized, um, it implies that unilateral efforts to curb automation are likely to backfire as domestic firms will simply lose uh, out business to, to the foreign uh, competitors. So just one example from the European context, which I uh, thought was curious, is that robot taxes have actually been voted on by the European Parliament, but it has not been on the agenda on any of the national parliaments. And I think the evidence presented in this paper rationalizes exactly why Robot taxes could have some appeal at the Europe-wide level while not being appealing for any of the uh, individual EU member states uh, in isolation. Um, so let me uh, just jump directly into the, to the discussion with those uh, words of praise. So a key uh, finding of the paper is that investment in automation leaves both labor shares and firm sales and employment shares across skill groups unaffected. So I think this is a surprising finding because changing factor shares are almost a defining feature of automation technologies. So what is automation? Um, through the lens of uh, the popular task-based model of production, automation is the reassignment of a production task from labor to capital. So if you combine that definition with cost minimization at the firm level, then you immediately get that uh, automation has to lower the labor share. Furthermore, if automation, uh, furthermore, automation has to change the employment shares across skill groups, except for the knife edge case where all skill groups have exactly 
the same comparative advantage in the task that is being automated. So where does this leave us? Does this uh, paper falsify the task-based task theory of automation? Or do the measured investment event not identify automation? So allow me to uh, propose a reinterpretation of the evidence, uh, which I think resolves some of this tension. So the identified investments, uh, investment events could mainly reflect capital deepening rather than adoption of new automation technologies. So what is capital deepening? Capital deepening are investments to improve the capacity of productivity of machinery in tasks that already have been automated. Indeed, when I think uh, carefully about the investment measure proposed in this paper, whether it's uh, the expansion of uh, electric capacity of motors used uh, uh, at the production line or simply machinery, uh, all machinery and equipment, it seems to me quite plausible that most of these investments reflect capital deepening. Furthermore, if we think about the ship share design, while I really appreciate um, the, 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 the steps towards getting a quasi experimental design, I speculate that the ship share instrument is particularly likely to induce capital deepening rather than adoption of new automation technologies. So this is because um, this is because the instrument uses price drops for machinery that the firm has already purchased in the past as a shifter to firm investment. Now contrast this to adoption of new automation technologies that require investment in new and different machinery compared to what the firm has purchased in the past. Still, I think the paper's findings here are really important because they imply that capital deepening rather than automation is a better model for most machinery investments. However, the findings do not rule out that some investments, whether it's adoption of robotic arms for pick and place tasks or numerical uh, controlled lathes for woodworking may embody automation technologies that displace workers on their production lines. And that uh, policymakers should keep an eye on for these specific technologies. So turning to my second comment, uh, I felt I kind of felt bad having this discussion without giving us a quick shout out to a long literature that has used similar balance sheet variables to estimate production functions. So prominent papers here include Ole Pekis uh, and Levinson and Petrin. So interestingly, this literature has used electricity consumption, a, a variable which is quite close to the um, proposed automation uh, measure of this paper as a proxy for firms Higgs neutral productivity. And this seems actually quite in line with the, with the estimated factor demand responses uh, uh, from this paper that, uh, that electricity or investment in electric capacity just uh, raises uh, employment, uh, employment across the board. So in general, uh, and this is a general comment, I would actually like to see uh, the automation and the production function estimation literatures speaking a bit closer to each other. Uh, in my own work, uh, I try to reconcile the two by estimating a production function using standard techniques, but then allowing for the adoption of automation technologies that require purchase of a specific type of machinery. So in my case, it was robotic arms but also requires the reorganization of the production floor, changing the production function. So this approach allows for both capital deepening and automation investment, but it requires the researcher to flag which machine types uh, that actually embody uh, automation technologies. So this leads me to my, uh, to my final comment, which is about measuring automation. So, Broadly speaking, um, I think there's two uh, complementary approaches to, to measurement. Um, one is to focus in on one specific uh, well-defined technology, such as robotic arms or CNC machines, um, which um, makes it easier to interpret. The caveat here is, of course, that it's a very specific type of technology, and we suspect that there are uh, much uh, that automation is a much more broad phenomenon. So to get at that broad phenomenon, um, the second approach uh, tries to seek out a general measure of automation. I think this paper proposes one which is really valuable, 
uh, that, that allows us to get broad coverage across industries, across tribes. And I think that's a really valuable contribution to provide such a measure. However, to leverage this broad coverage, and I'm sure the authors are, are, are gonna do this at some point, um, and to exploit the complementarities with the existing specific measures, I would propose that the paper first validate the general measure against specific well-defined technologies. For example, you can focus in on the sample of uh, robot importers and then ask, do the increases in electric capacity coincide in time with their adoption of industrial robots? So reassured by such a validation exercise, we can then leverage the broad coverage of the measure to study heterogeneity across industries across time. So one example that I would find fascinating to get, uh, get an answer to is, for example, was automation of car assembly in the 90s really an outlier, or is this a much more uh, broader phenomenon? So to wrap up here, as said, uh, I completely agree that this is a really important paper. It was a pleasure to read. Uh, I think it really uh, advances our understanding of both uh, the labor market, but importantly also the product market uh, implications of uh, automation technologies. Wonderful. Thanks so much for a great discussion uh, to both discussants, in fact. Um, so what we're going to do now for the remaining time we have, there are a few open questions um, and also we'll allow the author and co-authors to address some of the topics brought up by the discussion. So I'll hand it off to them and then I'll take it over and conclude in about eight minutes or so. Great. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Ajay and Anders, for very insightful discussion. So that's, that gives us a lot to think about for the next iteration. So that's very helpful. Uh, I thought I would just touch on a few of the points you raised and then uh, Celine and Philippe can jump in to add uh, to add anything. So, you know, it's going uh, in reverse, starting from uh, Anders' discussion. I think we completely agree with your three uh, headline points. They're all well taken and uh, we've already started working along, along those lines. So we'll hope to have more on, uh, as you said, the heterogeneity for different types of technologies. Connection to production function literature is also important. The, the, the thing I want to say a bit more on is the distinction between automation and capital deepening. I think there there is a risk in uh, getting trapped in a discussion which is more about words than economic realities. So you can always say that something is automation deepening and, and not the actual fact of, of automation. So we thought about this for a while and in the end we found that one productive way to go at this was to think about a reduced form effect that seemed to be policy relevant. For example, the shift in the price of uh, technology. So if, if you were to tax robots, for example, this would have an impact. Maybe it reduces the deepening of robot usage and you don't want to call that automation, but that's more the, the angle that, that we are interested in. And so that was just one point uh, to clarify here, but we also agree that it would be useful in the paper to include the discussion precisely between uh, capital deepening and, uh, and automation. And as to your point that automation sort of by definition should affect the factor share, our view here is that this is true at a you know, limited level of, so for example, the task level. But if you start thinking about some other level of aggregation, it becomes an empirical question. So you can write models where if only at the industry level or at the level of the economy, uh, the, sh the share could remain constant. Uh, even with when at the micro level you have these automation shocks, but that's also something we should uh, we should make more clear. So thanks a lot for that, and and thanks as well, Ajay, for your points. Your points about the balance sheet value, the power consumption are well taken. The your point about energy efficiency, I thought you would say that it would create a downward bias because if when uh, I automate more, actually my energy efficiency increases, then the increase in power consumption doesn't move as much. It's actually sort of weakened. And so I thought that, you know, you would say that could suggest that our effects would actually be even larger than, than what we document. But um, we uh, will see if we can perhaps focus on a subset of sectors where it's more likely that uh, energy efficiency doesn't change that much, or at least make more precise the checks that we've, uh, that we've done in this respect. Thanks a lot for the other uh, comments that will be very useful. And so we'll We'll go through through them and include that in the paper. Uh, maybe Celine, I think Philippe had to to run to uh, uh, something else, but Celine, maybe you had some points to add. 
Well, I think you, you said almost everything. I tried to answer a few questions. Maybe there are three left, so I don't know if you, yeah, if you want to answer them. I don't know if you had a look at... Uh... So I tried to answer some questions on the chat. Oh, I don't know, was, you mean the organizers yeah, should feel free? Essentially... Do the... you think it's better to have a lively discussion? On the intensity of, but you answered about this of uh, electricity use, you know, intensity and the, the question of uh, energy intensity and taking it into, into account. Uh, so uh, so you, you, you answered this just, uh, just before. Um, okay. Well, the rest. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Maybe with others who might want to ask questions. It, it looks like uh, Celine answered most of the questions in real time, which is uh, heroic. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's quite challenging because um, there were about. No, but 10 sometimes I think my answers were maybe quite short. But but uh, there, there were a few points I knew that Xavier would uh, would just uh, talk about them in the presentation, so I didn't want to be too long. But uh, yeah, it was essentially of the varying uh, on the issue of um, energy intensity uh, and uh, and other points but uh, which were just mentioned by the yeah by, by you so uh, I think we... great yeah. wonderful well I think that uh, that'll do it. that's good timing as well so first off thanks everyone for coming thanks to our presenter co-authors uh, and discussants for um, a great set of talks and presentation um, just a couple of reminders. Uh, this has been recorded, so if you had to step out, I saw someone had to fix lunch while doing this. Uh, if the presenter allows it, we will be uh, posting it online. Um, the other thing is remember, uh, I assume you're all interested in this area. Do not hesitate to submit papers. We like early papers, uh, ones that would generate a good conversation. So check the website for uh, submission. We're doing trying to do these every two weeks, so um, just keep sending them in. And then finally, we should have another um, Workshop in about two weeks. We're working on the details, but keep an eye out for that email announcement. Otherwise, everyone stay well and healthy and hope to see you soon.